The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey guys, it's Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at Ensemble and founder of financial advice company Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby I started from scratch a little bit over seven years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the Ensemble community to scale the business to become one of the better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators in Australia. And through this podcast, you can join me each Tuesday as I have the absolute privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'm going to selfishly be able to learn and continue my journey to improve every area of my advice business. Hopefully you can learn a few things on that journey as well. Jump over to Ensemble.com and if you haven't already signed up to learn and share from others or simply download the app. This podcast is proudly brought to you by 360 Health, MetLife's award-winning end-to-end health program designed to help your clients defend against serious health conditions so they can live healthier for longer. MetLife's 360 Health provides quick, easy and discreet access to over 50,000 leading local and global specialists, including general practitioners, doctors, psychologists, specialists and mental health clinicians. Talk to a MetLife sales manager today to find out more about how you and your clients can access expert medical support and guidance from the comfort of your own home. Hey guys, Ben from the Ensemble team and today I'm here with Ryan King. Ryan is the founder and advisor and his official LinkedIn title is Westy Hustler at Free King Wealth Management. Uh, Ryan, good to have you, mate. Thanks, mate. Good to uh, chat with you again, Ben. Mate, uh, you've got a, a super interesting business in, in the niche that, that you play in um, and I'm keen to get right into that. But I suppose to start, could you just unpack how you've ended up where you are today? Yeah, for sure. I think um, I won't go way back. There's a couple of podcasts I'm on where I go way back. So, you know, maybe a bit of a plug. People can go and find those somewhere. Just search my name, you'll find them. But I think uh, just as a as a, a quick background, I, uh, I grew up in the West or in between the West and the Central Coast. You know, I grew up in Mount Druid and in your minor as a kid. And, you know, just being around those parts, money's not really a priority other than spending it on some TNs or some ASICs. So, unless you steal them. So, um yeah, I grew up, I, I was doing whatever I was doing and then I ended up joining the military um, to try and get out of the, you know, make sure I was, was going to be all right. Joined the military, loved it, um, got injured in 2014, left 2015 and we had like a suicide sort of epidemic, I guess you call it. And I just did some research on my discharge on how I can help while I was recovering. And, you know, long story short, there was a big study, a link that I did, I uh, did 52 hours of, of inter- interviews and linked Basically, uh, a large majority of people said that their mental health was caused significantly by financial stress, you know, which as we progress forward, we find that out across this just gen, gen pop answer. But I thought, wow, you know, I can really help my brothers and sisters here from the military and weirdly started selling insurance because that was uh, the entry level for me then, the cold calling and door knocking, um, which I was pretty good at. I did. I got number one in Australia straight away, and but very quickly realized that I'm not, I don't like selling. This isn't the age of selling insurances for the purpose of selling insurances was dead and gone. And so I started studying, started studying, you know, because I, I was I was just naturally doing like cash flow and stuff with like budgets and that kind of stuff with clients for the insurance sales. And I was just this holistic approach naturally. And I stumbled across a, 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 a friend sort of like a colleague that was a, a financial planner and figured out, wow, that's kind of what I've started doing sort of. I, I'd like to explore this more. And I started studying and um, like started studying that particularly, not just the insurance stuff and, um, applied for a few jobs back in Sydney to come home when I was from from Bris- Townsville and Brisbane, and yeah, got back here at a at a small firm in Borkham Mills and started learning all about investments and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I sort of grew after my boots there pretty quickly, and you know that's where I ended up at announcer with uh with your mate Roxy and everyone did a couple. Roxy. Everyone's mate Roxy did a couple of um uh, probably six months or something there after during the Infocus merge. That was after I got like the In Focus Rising Star Award and I was, you know, up and comer there learning all that stuff. But pretty quickly realized that, man, this suit and tie stuff isn't me, you know, like I felt fake. I didn't enjoy the faking it till you make it feeling I had. I was telling people what to do with their money when I had nowhere near that kind of money. I'd never seen that kind of money, you know, like, and I understand the theories are all applied regardless, but I just, I just felt massive imposter syndrome. 
and I just wasn't comfortable. This just it just wasn't the the stuff that the people I wanted to help or, or like I know good people, but just wasn't me. So I floated this idea of starting this business called the Wealth Cartel, which was the original name I was going to go with, and everyone sort of was like, "What's that? What's that about?" And I said, "Oh, I want to look after a, a niche group of people called legitimate gangsters, and that's the you know, people who." might have grown up like me and come from that life, but have legitimate businesses. They like the flashy stuff. They like the watches. They like the cars. They like the houses, but they're legitimate. They, but they look like they might not be. And so that's what I want to help. Yeah, that, that's my thing. And everyone laughed at me and said, there's not a chance that'll work. Um, <laughs> so I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I sort of stuck at it. And then I just started, you know, hanging around. We were sitting at barbecues and I started to get really good at what I was doing. And we're sitting at barbecues and people are picking my brain and I'm like, man, I'm better than all these people that are, these people are listening to. And these are my people. These are my legitimate gangster people. And I was like, all right, we, uh, my wife and I decided to get married and just out of nowhere, I was like, you know, I'm going to get married. I'm going to quit. I'm going to start my own business. And so I did, I launched three Kings wealth management under the proviso of helping. It started out as legitimate gangsters as a thing, but I sort of niched down into, you know, uh, ambitious young hustlers, also known as Westie hustlers ambitious young hustlers who want to live today to the fullest while still planning and getting ahead tomorrow. And that's got me to where I am today. Mate, I love, I love it. And I think uh, I get a real kick out of marketing. I think it's a super interesting space, like like advice, the one-on-one part of advice and positioning things in different ways. And then it lands in different ways with people and connects with different people. And some people it does and some people it doesn't. And I think marketing is the same. It's one of those things that you put a message out there, but you're you know, the, the message is going out to the masses. And, um, when I look at your stuff come out, I think it, it speaks, it, you're definitely speaking to, to someone. Can you tell us a bit about, I suppose, how you've tackled the content and maybe some of the, 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 the sort of the learnings around that? Yeah. Um, mate, that's a really good point. Cause actually something I do heavily with my clients now, like one of the big things we do is helping them, yeah, you know as well, you know, you can only put more money in your pocket from spending less or earning more, right? They're the only two ways. Whatever the strategy is encompasses one of those two ways. And one of the, you know, you can only cut a budget so far before we start being a bit, you know, bit miserable. So one of the big things we do is how to earn extra income. But, you know, we talk about passive income and stuff like that, but that takes time, you know. So how can we generate income? And side hustles and businesses are a great way to do that. And I've pretty much just taken the approach that I took, which is exactly what you just said, which, uh, you know, early on, and I'll give a shout out to him, you know, Jackson Milan, he was my business coach at the start, um, you know, helped us kind of launch at the start and get this messaging across and opened my eyes to, if you speak to everyone, you speak to no one, right? And I used to think a niche was an age group, you know what I mean? Like an age group. That's other, hey, I'm looking after 35 to 45 year olds, you know, like that's my niche. Just like, oh man, that's not my niche. Um, and what I started learning was, uh, niching is all about it's not about the industry like you can you and you can make a niche out of anything you can be just doctors at this age or whatever or at the location people live but where i found my niche was the values right? i had to speak to people's values and those values might be the same for a doctor as they are for someone cutting hair as a barber out in the west but it was the values i was speaking to um and those values were people who were basically willing to do whatever was required to get to where they want to be and you know happy to live today while still planning for tomorrow, but don't want to just eat eat noodles and rice, hoping that one day I'll be rich. It's like no, let's get let's get a, tr- a plan to show that tomorrow's going to be okay. But whatever's left, let's enjoy that now, because tomorrow's not promised. And doing the marketing, like I really just started breaking that down. I started breaking down. Okay, well, what are the pains and gains? You know, what are the, if I was working for free? Who are the people I'd I'd love to still do this for, and and sort of go from there. And I looked at my journey as. Okay, well, if I want to look after these now, in five years' time, you know, a lot of people get in the industry and have, I want to work with superstars and rock stars and millionaires, but you can't do that straight away, so I've got to work a path. My answer to that was, no, no, I want to work with the same people just further along their journey in five years' time. And I sort of started building it out like that and building out, okay, what is, what is my, my, my avatar? My niche avatar is a, a guy named Tyson and his, his missus named Emily, right? Like, that's my, my niche avatar. And what is Tyson and Emily? Who do they follow on Instagram? You know, what are they doing in their spare time? How does this look? And just broke it all down from there, from demographic to values to age group, what their pains and gains are, what their behaviors are. If I was walking past them in the street, you know, what behaviors could I see that would tell me that, yeah, they've got the same pains as, as what I can fix? You know, what's their problem? What's the solution that I can show? And, you know, I say it all the time. At the end of the day, like people get too caught up in business about making money and selling, you know, just selling for the sake of selling when business is pretty easy. Like you, you, find, a, you, you find a problem that people have that you can solve. You figure out how to solve it. You tell those people that, that have that problem that you can solve it and then you solve it for them and then they tell everyone else, you know, and that, that's business. And 
Um, that was the niche. That's how I built my niche off the back of that, added the values in and had a very, very clear picture of exactly who I want to work with. And what's been the impact of, of that marketing and putting that message out to market? So it's funny. It's real funny. Like I, um, I got real caught up at like everyone in this. I hate social media. I always have. I hate it, you know? And one of my best mates is my idol because he runs a, like, it's like a, a half a billion dollar a year company revenue wise. And he's not on, you can't find him. You can't Google his name, right? Like it's, it's wild. You're like, man, like that, that'd be mad. But unfortunately, like I, I, I don't think I'd get to where I was without it. So what I got caught up in at the start was chasing those likes and chasing that reach and chasing those followers. And I, you know, I really associated that with the context of, of success and money. And I, I was terrible. Like I was spending so much time on it, chasing the algorithm where the algorithm basically says that, you know, more people like you, the more they'll see your stuff and the more you'll get out there. But unfortunately, and, and no offense or, or all the offense, whatever anyone wants to take to this, but a lot of the people out on social media are morons. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of morons out there and, most of them are consuming a lot. And when I started pushing my message to get likes, it was just getting liked by more of those people that would see it more. And the message wasn't getting cut through and my message was getting diluted. So I went back and I finally had to, you know, sit down myself and said, you know what, let's just push our message, you know, stop listening. A lot of the people were saying to me, oh, I don't resonate with that message or you shouldn't swear or you shouldn't talk about, you know, your weekend you know, activities or drugs or this or anything on your page. And I was like, yeah, but I don't want you to be, I used to listen to them. But then I started going, you're not my ideal client. So that's actually good. The fact that you're telling me you don't like that is actually really good. You know, a no in marketing is as good as a yes. You know what I mean? Like getting no's is just as important to understand where you're directing. And, but then the people that were my best clients were like, man, I really resonated with that message. And that was really funny. Like, you know, bullshit, you're front, you're up front. And, and I said, yeah, this is working, you know? So I just kept, just kept teetering down that stage and, and kept pushing the message that wasn't getting, you know, we're talking a thousand views on Instagram and like 20 likes, you know? And I was like, oh, this sucks. But I get like I'd get two two messages off it. I get two bookings, and fast forward today, we still only get like one to five thousand views on our Instagram story, our Instagram what do you call them, reels and stuff. Same as YouTube, I get smashed on YouTube Shorts. But like I, I get a new book, two one to two new bookings every single day in my calendar, and and that's that's really what matters because that's the impact. I can put my message out as much as I want, but it's like you know if if no one's booking it, I'm not changing people's lives. How much how much impact will cut through? I really having it's just noise if it's not doing anything, you know. That's right, yeah, and that's why I think like big leads or big followers, if they're not the right people or they're not taking action, are not helpful. And I think that there's like I've been getting into TikTok for the last year, and super, super interesting. And you see, um, you know, there's a bunch of people on TikTok, and they have these pages that they're optimized for for views and for maybe even for engagement and like getting these viral videos, but like they're not going to drive people to action. And I think if you're, if the intention of your putting message to market is to attract people that want to work with you, which mine 100% is, um, then that's the, that's got to be the the measure of success. And it's funny that you, for us, we've spent a lot of time going, okay, well, what works and what doesn't? And also who are the right people? And, and we spent a lot of time in our analytics going, well, okay, we're getting, you know, a whole bunch of leads from this particular source and that that sounds great, but then how many of them are becoming clients and have gone through a few different um, times where we've actually just stopped going down a path which looked really looked like it was doing a lot of stuff at the top of the funnel, but it wasn't doing anything at the bottom of the funnel. At the end of the day, it's like you can only do so much, so you've got to do the things that are going to have the outcome, the biggest impact on the outcomes that you that you actually want. And I think it's. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is really easy to get caught. Yeah, it, it, it's funny you say that, Ben, because I um like a big lesson on that. Like, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you a secret, right? I, I don't tell anyone this, but I'll tell you a secret. So I've got a software in my, my analytics channel, and you're actually one of the channels that I compa- I'm comparable against. Like, I follow your channel to see what your growth and your view, view rates are like, because your your business is a business that I feel pushes a message that's real, not just. And I'll, I'll say this: people get hurt by this. There's a lot of people out there. It's very easy these days to make money making noise and not making difference, right? Just getting eyes on you. And I feel there's a lot of people in our industry that have sold out to that. Where oh, I don't need to give advice anymore because I can get paid just pretending I am, you know, or, or making noise. And that's not me. That's okay. For this, something you do, that's fine. Do that all you want, but I want real cut through. It's like I say: what's the point of having the cure to cancer if you sell it to people with heart attacks? You know what I mean? It's not going to solve shit. So. 
I like I really and, and so I have analytics on you and two other businesses that I rate um, that tells me okay like if we're moving in similar directions that that's good for the for me for the industry and I've got analytics on companies or businesses and their pages that I, I don't rate and I it's, you should see the numbers the numbers are actually quite phenomenal like lots of engagement minimal growth like very uh, the cut through is crazy but the reason I the reason I went that way and I'd actually be really interested to see who these clients' advisors are these days because I, I, have to, I reckon they'd be you. I reckon you'd probably look after them. But they, um, they're the clients of mine who I'd had since day one. They were some really good friends of mine, really good. I really liked them. And when I started Three Kings and when I started going down that path, they actually um, terminated. My, it was my first client I'd ever lost, right? I was, I'm very big very big on don't, not losing clients. Um, and our first client, and they were really good friends of mine. Like we, like I'd seen the, both their kids grow up and I, I was quite heartbroken and I was like, oh man, like, can we have a conversation? Like, that's fine. You've got to do what's right for you. I'll, I'll fix it all up. And can we talk about why? And the one reason was I said, man, we'll be honest with you. Like, yeah, we love you, but you, you, it seems like you're doing a lot. Like on your Instagram, you, it looks like you're doing a lot and we're not feeling that. We don't feel like a lot's happening. And I was like, right. And I said, you know what? I think I even refunded them. I was like, you know what? Oh, I'm so sorry. Like, that's such a big wake up call here. Let me help you transition. I can recommend a few other advisors. And you were one of the advisors I recommended. So I recommend if you have advisors, you go, please, you need advice. You, you get a real good position. Go get that. And I'm going to work on this. And that day changed my entire business trajectory. I stopped messing around with the noise. And I was like, I'm going to do what matters here. I'm going to actually make, make proper change. I'm going to focus on what's mattering. But it is hard when you're a startup business to get out of that noise because you do need that momentum, you know? Yeah. And you, like me, like when I started my business, I was the only advisor. And I think I definitely had that conversation with clients as well that, so always super interested in marketing, um, you know, had some growth plans for the business. And then, so you're doing all this stuff and it is, you sort of reach that tipping point and I, we're just chatting a bit offline and you, you know, you're sort of getting to that level as well, that it is, it is a tricky time where you go, well, like I needed, I need to keep working on growing the business and growing the team and then doing these things to keep that going. But at the same time, you've got, um, you know, you've got to make sure that you're managing the client's perception as much as anything. And it can be that difficult when you're trying to be everywhere all of the time um, that you, yeah, it's, it's I, I don't know that I ever cracked the code on that, although it has become easier. <laughs> and you, that, that word, that word perception is crazy, man. Like I, I, I actually had to get a, rain, a check, like a bit of a chin check because when I was at other businesses, including announcer, you know, one of the big things was I felt there was there's so much perception. Everyone talking. I was like, man, stop talking about perception. Let's talk about real. Like, like I don't want people to perceive. I want it to be real. And that's what I thought automatic was a general real. But I realized it's kind of like in training, you know, adherence to a program is the most important thing. You can put out the best program, but if the client doesn't adhere to it because they don't understand or like it, it's not going to mean anything. And I didn't get that at the start. I was like, no, I'm like, I'm these clients. What they didn't know, like we had just had a meeting and off the back of that meeting, I'd done advice and a lot of my clients aren't very good at reading advice. And I, I must admit, I probably wasn't great at explaining it then. You know, we had actually ended up reducing their risk and changing this investment portfolio and we'd saved them at the start of COVID. It was something like 70%, right? Like we'd done this, which you know, each to their own or what happens, but we'd basically made them about 70% in like a small month period from, from strategic advice. But I hadn't explained it very well. Like they just sort of went along with it because it was me and they'd signed the advice and done that. But they... The perception was that we weren't doing much, even though in my head I was like, we're doing so, we've done so much. Like I literally just saved just 75 grand in three months. I made just 75 grand and that was big compared to the rest of their portfolio. And I was like, but then I realized it's important. Like perception is important in this, you know, you've got to, not only the perception that you have on the market, but the perception your clients have of what's really happening. And that was game changing. And those clients, like to this day, if you're like, I'll take them to dinner for the rest of their lives because to this day, they, I don't know where my business would be if that didn't happen. Yeah, it's a super interesting and that psychology side of things, it really, and, and the, the business impact of that, it really it fascinates me, it challenges me and it, it frustrates me at, uh, at a lot of times as well, but it is a really important one. And I know for us, like it's the, the, the perception, client's perception of the value of advice and what you're doing is, is crucial, right? It's crucial to their likelihood of success. And I think that that's something that and we still um, have a, a lot of work. We just had a workshop with our our team this morning that it's like we know for a client that the value comes, like just the financial upside value comes in all of these different areas and that it's like, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars and sometimes even hundreds of thousands of dollars. But sometimes they're not achieving it and especially uh, they're not, sorry, perceiving it. And particularly for um, younger clients that are seeking out financial advice they're typically the ones that are the high achievers they're seeking advice because they want to you know kick a bunch of ass and get that way ahead 
And they're generally like w- when you ask them how they're going or how they feel that they're going, they'll go, oh, yeah, I f- I'm feeling like a seven out of 10. And then you're like, oh, hold on a sec. Like um, you've what you've done in the last 12 months is you bought that, you know, that second investment property and that's great. <laughs> and you saved like $35,000 and your investment portfolio has grown by $80,000 and then you've done all these different things and they're like, oh, fuck, yeah. Um, oh, that's right. But, <laughs> but they don't yet own that $5 million dream home that they yeah. really So they're feeling... But isn't, isn't, the, isn't, the, um, isn't the juxtaposition of that when someone new comes in with an absolute dog shit financial scenario and they, they go, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm a 10. It's like, whoa, what? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And you go, you go, that's wild. Like this, the, this, the behavior. Like, and so like I'm in, doing my master's at the moment and, and I want to go down my PhD route and the thesis area that I go down is, but I love behavioral finance, right? The, the impact people's mind have on their money. I just think, I think there's so much more to that than what people pay attention to. And that's something that we do. And it's what you were saying before about the financial benefit, right? Like I did a, we've actually just pivoted our marketing campaign recently to get away from how much we make people and, and that kind of stuff because the same thing happened to us, man. And we did a feedback across our clientele and I was like, tell me, what do you value the most? And the number one thing people come back with was, bro, we just love that you're our hype man. Like if we're feeling down and whatever, like we can just give you a call. Because my clients, we do formally two meetings a year, six monthly. But I tell them, and this is why I've got so much staff behind me for one advisor is because I say my best clients catch up with me 10 times a year, right? Like I want to speak to you every month, even if it's just 15 minutes, let's get on the phone. Let's have a, let's have a hype call, you know? And I know it's not scalable. I tell advisors all the time, do not copy what I do. You won't be profitable. But I, um, I like, that's what we do. That's what I love. And they go, man, we just love the fact that I can send you an Instagram message if I'm feeling down or I'm unsure about which toilet paper roll to buy, you know what I mean? And you, you're there and. You know, if I'm, I'm not sure about what's going on, you'll hype us up. Or if I'm getting a bit too full of myself, you'll bring us back down. You know, like that's the thing. And so we've completely pivoted out. And that, that's what our best clients say. They're, they go, we, we we know you give us our reviews. We know the financial stuff there. You've, you've teached and taught us that consistency is all that matters. It'll come, you know, everything will come. And when you've built the trust, now where we see the value is just being our hype man. So our, our whole marketing pivot now is really more about you know, do you have someone good in your corner to tell you, one, when you need a bit of a boost, two, to give you the knowledge on how to actually execute on that boost, and three, to tell you when you're being an idiot? Because if you don't, that's us. Let's go. You know, that's where we really add value. Mm. Yeah, it's it's um, it's um funny, but they you have to train them into that, I think, because people- 100%. They don't understand. But that's where your social media comes. That's the one thing about Instagram that I love that I used to hate is- I now use my social media to train people before they come on board that that's who I am and that's what we do and that's where the value is. And when they come on board, they're so much further along that journey now. It's crazy. Yeah, totally. I love it when the people say the things that you say back to them. It's the things that they <laughs> want. It's like, well, of course, it sort of makes sense that they're saying that because they've followed along from the sidelines for however long. Um, but it does make it, it does make the whole advice process a lot easier. I was just going to oh. say, that's why when we're talking about the niche marketing, the part that I loved about that was that the more that when I was doing the the you know, before trying to grow, my conversion ratio was horrible. When I got more niche and more down and down into it, like my conversion ratio is almost a hundred percent now from Instagram. Where before it was like fifteen. It's crazy. Mm, yeah, it's a power of the consistent message. I think in the right message to the right people. Yeah, for sure. But honestly, I could talk about marketing all day. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I'm sure you probably could as well. But, uh, I'd love to hear you've been at it for about three. Uh, a bit over three years now. What's what have what have been the biggest shifts in your business over that time? So yeah, we've been at it like we've been at it actively for about two and a half years. The year and a half before, so we've been in business for four years technically. The year before that was changing licensees, and I went through some personal stuff, and we didn't really go. So the two and a half years, what I really approached it on, and the big shifts in that time, I guess, is the first and foremost would have to be the pivot everyone had to make around COVID. So in multiple ways, right? Like not just yeah, out of office working and that kind of stuff. But for us, like I was so reliant on, I guess, strategy in the way of always having to back up my stuff with numbers. And, you know, I, was, I found myself after COVID, especially especially just recently with like Russia, Ukraine stuff. Like I felt like I was constantly saying, oh, we're in a once in a lifetime thing. I was like, bro, I've said this four times in my career. I've only been in, in advice for six years, you know, like, I've had four one in once in a lifetime things, and I can't. I've got to find a different way to sort of present this, and that's where I started really diving more into the psychology and, and pivoting around. Let's talk about you and how. What, what can we control? You know, what can you control, and how can we go down that path? And 
now, man, I think to, to be honest, like advice is a real secondary point. I said this to you offline. We, we have a real mix of coaching, you know, like we, I know a lot of advisors hate financial coaching and influences and that stuff. And I, oh, yeah, I just think everyone having a crack, do what you're going to do. I can only influence what I influence. And, but I, I, for our clients, we have a real nice mix. Like we do the advice once a year, maybe twice a year. If they're a bit more complex, every year they get their advice, but then we have a coaching membership. So our clients sign up for advice when they come on board, they pay up front like an investment and they get advice and then they have a coaching membership and the coaching membership is come in, educate. We've got programs, we've got things like that. And, and we just educate them and coach them a bit of self-doing, a bit of us doing it and allows us to re- has allowed us to really get on top of the ball with such. And I think the reason is in the last two or three years, the economy is changing every couple of months, right? Like we've gone from the lowest rates ever to, to no inflation. Then we've got COVID comes around. We've got markets going down. We've got peak property prices. Then we've got low property prices. And they're back to peak. And then we've got the stock market taking a dip and coming back. And now we've got interest rates rising and potential property or potential um, recession coming down. And we've got, mar- again, the Russia-Ukraine. We've got markets like constant change. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I wasn't around 10 years ago. For this, but 10 years ago, you could get away with your annual reviews and you, that, that would do, you know. And it's allowed me to get more involved with my clients and focus on what's really important and what they can control and talk to them more about, hey, you can only control how much you earn, spend less than what you're allowed to spend and put this much in your future account. If you do those three things and we stay consistent, everything else will happen. And then let's focus on goals off the back of that. So let's focus on living a good life and enjoying ourselves. And, you know, we really pivoted away from the traditional financial advice model, which we still incorporate heavily. It's the main part of our business, but we've just added that coaching side and the more uh, frequent touches and the, the less less complexity i guess like 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 there's still complexity but I, I feel like there's more complexity over the long horizon in the short term and the short term stuff's where you can really generate the capacity to get that complexity and we just started focusing more on that short-term changes rather than waiting for a client to get capacity over time so then we can do complex stuff if that makes sense yeah it does yeah it's simpler but it's harder that's the thing yeah like it it's you thought of life would be more complex but potentially easier uh but the behavior change the habits the like you said the focus keeping themselves hyped up um doing controlling all the things that you can control and then keeping that consistent over a long period of time that's the that's the difficult thing and requires real change so uh but also you know obviously with the rise of technology um that's that's where it's all going so uh you know that i think that's where our clients maybe want us but definitely where they need us and uh yeah I, in my view that's the future for sure yeah for sure mate what's um what's on the horizon for you guys what's what the focus at the moment what's coming up so we put a pretty audacious goal out this year um you know we've got our infrastructure and everything set up i took it pretty easy last year we only took on 28 clients last year and we we opened our books for three months uh which got us to over the hundred and I think it's 112 or 116, I don't know, somewhere around there for clients. And, you know, it was pretty good. It was pretty manageable. Um, and so, you know, got all the infrastructure, got my staff laid out, got all that happening. And then this year we're going to go pretty hard and try and get to 200, um, 200 clients. And that will then keep me to the point where I can then branch that, uh, branch that infrastructure out and look at another advisor and look at scaling and essentially getting me to do less of the stuff I, which I, like I said, the offline, I've never, I think I've logged into Explain once and what I lied to you, I don't, or I haven't at all, I don't know, but you know, I just talk to clients and do basic strategy and everyone else in my team does, does the other stuff. And I'm, I'm just, that's why I can speak to people, you know, once every month kind of thing with that many clients. So we've worked out the 200 is the capacity where I can no longer provide that value above that. So we want to get to that or as close to that as possible and then start looking in the next phases. But you know, I've got other businesses in the works as well. And, and um, you know, I think uh, I said I'm about to close a deal on my seventh business this year. And, you know, we're big. We're big on doing partnerships with clients, which I know people frown upon, but I don't care. They frown upon most of my business, the way I run my business. But we are, uh, you know, we, we find a niche and we find a lot of our clients have these skill sets that we could leverage and either they don't have the money or they don't have the business acumen and I can provide one of those two things and we go in. And so this year we want to launch a few more businesses with clients um and just help clients launch their businesses and i'd really like to establish myself in the in the accumulation area of you know i guess you got investors and you got this but like the the hustle you know i I say i'm a westy hustler and i look after young ambitious hustlers and the thing i pulled last year was i was i'd gotten three kings to a place you know off scratch that i was pretty proud of but i wanted to then have a crack you know I, i don't own property 
you know, I've got a, I've got my shares and that kind of stuff. My super does well, but I was just really putting everything into three kings, which was worthwhile. The valuation's great and it works, but I then was like, all right, this year is going to be about growing three kings rapidly and and focusing on my own accumulation. So then I can, you know, I can basically expand that out to clientele and show you, you know, this is how we do it. This is what I've done. This is what works. This is what doesn't. And, and let's 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 start getting people to not just be in there nine to five unless they want that. But my niche doesn't really, they want that, those nicer things and, and really cementing myself as if you want to take things to the next level for the, my, my, that target age group and that, that kind of client, you know, King is your man. King is the guy that'll successfully get you to open something up and have skin in the game. And, and this is something a bit different to what normal most advisors do, you know, just offer a service that isn't really out there at the moment. Well, I think I've found the topic for our next two podcasts, the, the how the VC uh, business <laughs> this accelerator one uh, works and also how uh, bring another advisor into the mix works because that's a whole other another can of worms, but made some exciting <laughs> time. Um, yeah, no, it's not. I'm pumped. My last question for you is that if you could go back to your day one self and do one thing differently, what would it be? A how far day one, like school day one or just advice day one? Three kings day one. Yeah, I think the only thing, and I was I'm fortunate that it didn't pan out that way for too long, is just don't trust anyone. Oh, this is probably bad, I know, because you know, Ensemble is such a good a good community. But for me, um, I surrounded myself with the people that were in the industry older, and and you know, I really heavily le- leaned on them. Like I heavily lent on them to say, "How do I do this?" And they pushed me down a direction that was their way. Not, and I basically just kept getting told, "What you do won't work. What you don't won't work." And I kind of let that get in. I didn't back myself at all, you know. I didn't back myself at all, and and that took that took about uh, a year and a half and about sixty thousand dollars out of my kitty to learn that lesson. And so, if I could go back, I would have just because as soon as I started doing exactly what I thought I could do from the get go, I started doing well, making money, being happier. Um, if that's the one thing, if I could go back, would just be back yourself more. You know, you, you trust that you've got the right, you do have the right people. Right? Don't go and lean on people that you think do just because they've been in there longer you know anything like that and yeah, yeah just back yourself and, and and if you're committed enough and you're passionate about it enough and you've got the skill set behind you it, it should work well we're in the new age so i think sometimes you've got to have it's not that you know things were different when you've got someone that's got tons and tons of experience but it could be experience in a different market and you know that's less relevant if you're trying to do something that's completely new but mate it's great to it's great to watch i'm super pumped to to see what's what's coming up for you and Mate, I look forward to our next conversation. Appreciate it, mate. Love it as, as always, and I look forward to the next one. Thank you, Kingy. And team, we will catch you on the next one. Bye for now.